Welcome to the 26th Nigerian Economic Summit with the theme, Building Partnerships for Resilience. To put Nigeria on the trajectory of development and competitiveness, it is imperative to empower the subnational governments. The necessary tools must be in place to unlock their subnational factor endowments. This big conversation for action can shed more light on the key factors hindering the empowerment of subnationals in Nigeria and how we can mitigate them. Welcome to this plenary, Rethinking Subnational Competitiveness. NEST 26, Building Partnerships for Resilience. Uh, before we came in, um, I was telling Your Excellency that this session has attracted a lot of interest. And let me also say that when we are planning this summit and we selected the speakers, there was no question on who to whether we should invite them or disinvite them. <laughs> that the it was unanimous that everybody wanted to come and hear this 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 session. So on that note, let me I'm not sure I should do more introductions. We already we've already heard our panel members, the best and the best. And so we have, um, can we see uh, the governor of Ogun State, Your Excellency Baba Abiodun, just to make sure that he's, on, he's online. So they said, okay, he will join us shortly. But let me start by saying that we have been, even from yesterday and what we've been reading, we've had so many issues with regards to our country, Nigeria, in terms of how do we move the country forward. Over the years, we've had the planning and development of the country, mainly driven by the federal government. And we are about 60 years now, so we have many, only a few people here that are above 60 years. That means if you've done something for over 60 years and there remain challenges, of course it's time to rethink the challenges. And I'll say, what is the best way? What is the best solution? What are options available to us? And after, based on different summit that we've had, we are thinking that it is time to say that it's time to rethink our subnational uh, um, uh, um, uh, states, regions, local governments, and all that, to say, is there any way we can make them a lot better so that they can function? Because at the end of the day, we are told that we have over 100 million Nigerians uh, described as poor. We have unemployment increasing. All these poor Nigerians reside in our different states. The unemployment in our different states. So it is very important that we rethink both constitutional, legal, regulatory, social, economic factors that we can use to more or less empower our subnationals. And as we already know that our panel members are people who can be described as veterans in this space. And of course, we also know that Professor Justin Lee, who is a former chief economist of World Bank and vice president, and is currently the dean of a big think tank in China, he has a lot of experiences in these areas. And of course, uh, Dr. Valeria Zinge San has been in, at the forefront of promoting subnational uh, empowerment and competitiveness. In, from his, uh, her experience in 2014 National Conference. And interestingly, Your Excellency, I'm not sure everybody know what you say about subnational competitiveness and restructuring and all that and all that. Only last month, late last month, you actually emphasized on the need to restructure the country. So I will start with you. So based on what you've uh, experience, you've been in public service since 1998 or 1999. So I think in terms of retiring, it's time to, that you're already, you're already, you're already reaching the age of 30 years in public service. So, so based on what you've experienced, what are those challenges, factors, Lego, any, any kind of factor you can think of that are more or less constraining subnationals to really achieve their true potential? to properly contribute to our national development. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin by thanking the Nigerian Economic Summit Group for inviting me. You know, to invite me to a conference these days requires a lot of courage. 
because uh, those that don't want to hear what they don't want to hear usually disinvite me. Um, so I thank you for inviting me and having the courage to listen to some of my very heretical views. Uh, but seriously, uh, coming back to Nigeria and federalism, it is very clear to every objective Nigerian that this system is not working. And uh, Albert Einstein said that if you do something in the same way and expect a different result, then that is the definition of insanity. So I think we need to have a very honest, robust, and collective conversation about how to redesign our country to work better because it is not working very well. Uh, Nigeria consists of 36 states, and Nigeria can only make progress if all the 36 states are making progress and pushing in the same direction. The federal government has only 8,000 square kilometers of land called the Federal Capital Territory. Uh, every other territory in Nigeria is under the control of state government. And most of the people that live in Nigeria, other than those that live in Abuja, are residents of state. And while it is uh, popular to say that the federal government is responsible for everything, the president must solve every problem. The reality is, if you look at our constitution, with all its uh, flaws today, most of the problems that the average Nigerian faces from day to day uh, are really problems that should be solved by state governments. So why are they not solving these problems? Uh, this, th these are my views. Please do not take them as views of the Nigerian Governors Forum or anyone. These are my views uh, based on uh, my experience in the last uh, uh, 20 years in public service. I think that the political culture, not only at the national level, but even at the state level, uh, does, not lead, does not lead to the emergence of committed and competent political leaders. There is a problem with the political culture that needs to be looked at. The second is that uh, politicians have tended, and maybe this is part of the political culture, have tended to weaponize division uh, to gain political power. And we need to be very honest and responsible about that and understand that you, once you divide people to get power, it is very difficult to get them to collaborate again to make progress. And you need to collaborate to make progress. The third uh, problem, in my view, is the culture of centralization. Maybe because we've been under military rule for a long time, uh, our federal republic is only a federal republic in name. There is a, there is a lot of concentration of power um, at the center to the point that the federal government is so overstretched that it is not very effective in doing many things, uh, uh, which leads me to the fourth, is we need to look at our constitutional arrangement and devolve more responsibilities to the states and hold them accountable. Um, I say this because I want to give an example of one issue that faces the country and many of our states, insecurity. Today, uh, the Constitution says I'm the Chief Security Officer of Kaduna State. But I have no troops under my control. I have no police. Uh, I don't even have a say on who is my Commissioner of Police. And if a policeman uh, serving in Kaduna State uh, does something that is illegal and lawful, uh, I cannot sanction him. I report him to the CP, he will be posted to one part of the country and he will be hidden for a few years. And after I leave office, he will come back to Kaduna State to continue where he's, he left off. So governors are chief security officers in name, but unless they have a very special relationship with their commissioners of police and military commanders, they can't really get them to do what is needed to, 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 to secure the, the state. So we need to, in my view, these are some of the reasons why the 
uh, states are dysfunctional, and there is a fifth one, uh, uh, which is we over-depend as states on the Federation Account for Resources. Um, many state governments cannot even pay salaries until they receive that monthly check from Abuja. And um, this reliance on Federation transfers has made many states lazy, uh, not working hard enough to actually uh, realize the full potentials of revenue generation in their states. Uh, some are doing better than others, and I think that the current economic crisis compounded by the, uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, have forced state governments to be more inward looking. Um, but there are constraints. Um, because there are many things states may want to do, but the constitutional arrangements prevent them. And I give just one example, which is part of our report on state federalism. Today, uh, land is vested in the states by the constitution, by the Land Use Act. However, the minerals under the land are vested in the government of the federation. So you have a ministry in Abuja issuing licenses for mining, but when the person comes with the mining license, he cannot access the land unless he gets title from the states, and the states get involved in getting the communities to collaborate with him. That is why our solid mineral sector has not taken off. Oil has got the attention of the federal government long ago, so there is something being done there. But this is, this is the problem, unless and until uh, on the one hand, the constitutional framework is modified to give the states control over some of these resources uh, until many of the items on the exclusive list in the constitution are transferred to the concurrent list so that the federal and the state governments can all legislate on them and work on them. And until we as state governors move away from the mentality of waiting for checks from Abuja to get on with governance, I think we'll continue to underperform as a country. Uh, so in brief, what I would put forward for consideration of the panel is that we need to restructure at, uh, you know, in, in at least three levels. We need to look at our constitution and have an honest conversation and do the right thing in the overall interest of the country. We need to restructure our politics um, so that we change our political culture in a way that searches and actively promotes competent and committed people in governance. No country has ever made progress without putting its best and brightest in politics and public service. And right now, we're not doing enough of that. Uh, thirdly, uh, the state governments must impose certain restrictions on themselves. Maybe a constitutional amendment is needed, for instance, to say, that no state government should have a government more expensive than its internally generated revenue. Because Lagos can to have a 20, 25 commissioners, for instance, but Ekiti cannot, because Ekiti does not have the tax base of Lagos. So maybe we need to impose on the states some constitutional restraints, some very hard and soft constitutional restraints to say that the size of your government, the number of commissioners you have, what you spend on your recurrent budget should not exceed your IGR, so that all federal transfers should go to capital projects, for instance. I'm just giving uh, you know, an example. Um, so it's a mix of um, federal, state, and national and state assemblies looking at the constitution and doing some adjustments while the states themselves and the state governors impose certain constraints and discipline on ourselves um, because that is the only way we will be trusted with more responsibility and with more uh, resources and uh, latitude to operate. Uh, I will stop here because I, I think it's more important to have more questions from uh, uh, the audience than for me to ramble on. Uh, a lot of what I'm saying is in our true federalism uh, committee report and it's online. If you Google it, you'll find it and read it. I, I still believe 
that that report provides a very credible and balanced roadmap to begin the gradual process of federalizing our country. Because the truth is, though we are called Federal Republic right now, we are not quite a Federal Republic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me uh, move to Dr. Azinga. I read recently that National Assembly said that both the APC uh, chaired by Governor Rufai report on restructuring and even the 2014 National Conference report that they have it and they will consider all of them in the constitutional review. Based on your experience and what you passed through throughout that period up to today, what are those critical challenges you think that we need to address to really empower ourselves nationally? Thank you very much. Um, I want to first start by saying that I adopt all that His Excellency has said here because that has been my opinion for people who have been following me over the years and also documented in the works of the 2014 National Conference. And without fear of repetition, I will just mention some that he has already done in a causal manner and go to those he has not mentioned. And I would say that yes, decentralization of power is key. The restructuring of the architecture of this country as is presently is, is very necessary. Devolution of powers is very essential for the subnationals. And I will also say good governance. Good governance emanates from agronom. And if you look at the work of the National Conference, after looking at various thematic issues in the country, we decided to make a report and break it down into three segments. One is recommendation on the review of the Constitution where it's absolutely necessary. Two is reformation and strengthening of existing laws to give them the teeth to bite. Because some laws are just there and you can't enforce it really. And then thirdly, as, uh, under the statutes also, is to create new statutes where there is none at all. Then we also have policy recommendations because there are some aspects of our, our life where there are no policies. There are some that are flooded by policies, but the policies are not working. So at the bottom line is re-engineering, using the instrument of the law to see how we can re-engineer a society to get it working. We've been provided the platform by the amalgamation documents of 2014 that gave us 100 years to try it out. We've tried it out, it's expired on 2014, and it is now ripe to have a conversation. Where do we go from here? Uh, in order not to repeat him anymore, I want to say that one basic tool we all forget is the process of electioneering in Nigeria. We, we talk about INEC being an independent organization. Is it truly and in fact an independent organization? Does it bring out the best and the brightest? We talk about internal democracy in political parties. Is that really happening? Are we having imposition of candidates? And at the end of the day, we blame ourselves and say, oh, uh, where did we get this person? So our political parties are not working the way they ought to be work. And furthermore, we have ceilings on election uh, finances. Who obeys it is observed more in the breach. So therefore, when will you ever give that young man in the street the opportunity, even though he has all that it takes, to ever come and contest? Because there are bottlenecks in the law. And therefore, even in the political parties, for him to emerge, it is a difficult and uphill task. The chairmanship of INEC. This has generated a lot of controversy. Yes, the president appoints, appoints the chairman of INEC, appoints the commissioners. There's been a lot of hula balloo. 
should the president really appoint or should he be appointed by an independent organization? At the conference, there was a lot of ideas whether the NJC should appoint the chairman of INEC. But to me, whichever convolution we take on the appointment of INEC, NJC is also, the judiciary is also an arm of government. I think that the chairman or ship of INEC that's supposed to produce for us credible, excellent candidates to govern us, the people must have a say in who becomes the chairman of INEC. Concede the appointment to the president. But like in the profession that I belong, for you to become a senior advocate, you go through so many rigors. Your name is published for the public to comment. And when the public comments, is sent to the MBA for scrutiny before it gets back to the Supreme Court where you are interviewed. So I believe that, yes, we subject him to Senate, we subject him to, uh, uh, to, to security scrutiny, but the people must have a say so that we stop complaining about one man, one vote. I need not go into details about so many things that is wrong with our electoral system. I watched a governor on television saying that for us to get it right with INEC, that he experienced in the 2015 elections where results printed by INEC were also printed the same numbers for two different candidates. So if this can happen, this is coming from a participant in an election. And we're also told in all the dailies, if it's anything to go by, that somebody who participated at the election also procured sensitive materials for INEC. To what extent does this make electioneering transparent? That's a million dollar question. We go to the judiciary. The judiciary has presently constituted. A lot of work needs to be done in our constitution to restructure it. We must have a situation whereby federal offenses are handled by federal courts and state offenses handled by states. We should have the appellate courts in the states. We should have the Court of Appeal. We should have the Supreme Court of every state. They are capable of handling their, their, their issues. We have the criminal <laughs> law. We, we, we see a situation whereby the land tenure system in Onita, for instance, the Kulano system, goes all its way to the Supreme Court. What is it doing there? It's the custom of Anambra people. And I believe that in the states, the High Court will have all it takes to interpret it as well as their own state court of appeal and their, and their, and their, and their, and their uh, Supreme Court, we should decongest our appellate courts. They overburdened. And therefore, what does it lead to? Delay in trials. And go to the axiom, delay denies justice. To some extent, we have to touch it and think how it is seriously. And then, we come to the issue of policing. Security is a very serious matter in this country today. We have gotten to the level, the abysmal level, where I read in the papers about kidnap of policemen by non-police people. The people who are policing us are being kidnapped. You also read in the papers how state governments in different states of the federation are helping the states, are helping the police with vehicles, with equipment here and there, whereas it's not a state police. Say, look at the NSAS protests. We have a lot of lessons to learn from COVID-19 and the NSAS protests. Hitherto, like I said about delaying court trials, the judges are burdened with long hands. That is part of the delay. But with COVID, we accelerated and we are now enjoying visual trials of proceedings. 
So it has accelerated the process that we've been arguing for over the years. You take the answers. I'm the chief security officer of a state. There, is, there are burning issues. Your state is on fire. You can't give instruction. There's nothing you can do. You're paralyzed. And if you dare invite the military, another constitutional issue. Are they supposed to really be there? Who, 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 who shot the bullet or who did not shoot the bullet? So many constitutional issues begin to arise. So you make somebody a, a governor and give him certain rights, but you deny him the basic tenets or tools for which he can function. There is a dysfunctional element there that goes to no issue. We come to our educational system. What we have, with the greatest respect, my husband is a professor, <coughs> so I don't mean to cast any aspersions on their intellectual integrity. But I dare say that our educational curriculum is crying for serious restructuring. Where is it taking us to? You have graduates of uh, engineering, and he says, I'm a graduate of automobile engineering, but he, re he relies on the artisan in the street to repair his car. Gone are the days of Ajumobis of Lagos State that created the first car and would have had it running today, but for his death. What is happening to our educational system? Why is the curriculum failing us? Why is it that Chinese government or Chinese uh, businessmen will come into this country and notice the time, the level, the energy spent in preparing a basic food, pounded yam. They go back and manufacture a machine. And you just plug it, in three minutes, the yam is boiled and is ready, it's already pounded. Something that will take you hours. That man hours means a lot to our economy. So in other words, we need to rejiggle the education system. And then come to physical federation that His Excellency talked about. L let, me, let me stop you. Okay. Um, but I'm sure we agree that he has spoken like a very, very senior advocate of Nigeria. <laughs> and I think uh, it's, 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 it's not questionable. But the point that you and I stopped you is the right point for Professor Lin to come in. Okay. Professor Lin, you've argued that the country's industrial makeup is drawn from its factory endowment, especially human capital and natural resources. Given your experience from World Bank, China, different parts of the world, what are those things you think that Nigeria can pick? And that will actually be easily implemented or adopted into the country, as particularly to empower our subnationals. Professor Lim, please. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be a panelist in this session, and especially to speak with my good friend, Governor of Kaduna State, El Rufay, and also together with Mrs. Ajinger. And I prepare my PPT. I'll talk readings. The first one I will say, industrial policy is needed for national and subnational competitiveness. Although I know industrial policy is a taboo in many corners of the global development community. Then I'll talk about new challenges from the pandemic, about using industrial policy to enhance competitiveness in national and subnational. And then at the end, I'll talk about the strategy for supporting a fast recovery and to enhance the competitiveness. <clears throat> Why industrial policy? is essential because economic development is a process of structural transformation. On the one hand, 
the technological innovation in exclusion energies, and also industrial upgrading to move the production from raw value added industry like agriculture to a higher value added industry like manufacturing, so that the labor productivity and income can be enhanced. And also it's a process of continuous improvement in hot infrastructure and institution governance and so on to reduce the transaction cost. And uh, from my studies, the new structural economics, the best way to enhance and to facilitate this process is to follow a nation, certainly also some national, you know, competitive advantages determined by its endowment structure. Because the competitive advantages is the foundation of competitiveness in a nation and certainly also in a region. And two institutions are essential. One is competitive markets that will provide the incentive as well as the pressure for the firm to upgrade their industry or to adopt technology according to the competitive advantages. But at the same time, it's necessary to have a facilitation state to you know, overcome the externalities that are provided by the entrepreneur and also to coordinate the improvement of institutions and uh, infrastructure so as to reduce transaction costs and to make the competitive advantages become competitive advantages. And because the resources available for the national or subnational governments are limited. And with that, certainly it's essential to use the resources strategically to support the industry which the country or the nation has competitive advantages. And in a federal system like Nigeria, some national government plays crucial role in, in enhancing the competitiveness and the structures transformation. And that's the necessity for industrial policy. But we know there are some challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic because this pandemic, you know, causing the recessions. And uh, according to the briefing that I read, you know, currently there are a large number of unemployment in Nigeria. And uh, many people may be falling back to the poverty in Nigeria. And not only so, some young students, some school children, they lose the opportunity of education because they don't have access to online facility and so on. And those kind of loss of education will have a long-term you know, implication for their ability to attain the job markets. And also the trade is suppressed and uh, coaching the loss of revenue, like the commodity trade always, the price has been at a low level and the remittance also has been reduced. And as a result, the national and subnational government, they are facing the issue of fiscal deficits. And uh, so in the future, the national and subnational government will have less resources to use industrial policy to increase competitiveness and facilitate structural change in the post-pandemic recovery. And this is the challenges that we need to face. And in the past, we may be able to rely on international assistance, but this time the developed country, they are also hit by the pandemic and they are also facing the surge in the government deficits as well as the populism and nationalism in their country. And so very likely 
they will not be able to be generous in supporting the recovery in the developing country, certainly, including in Nigeria. And under this kind of challenges, what would be the best way for the subnational and national government to you know, respond to the situation? I think that the first thing is to you know, have some kind of quick wins by using the government limited resources for generating job exports and revenues that can have an immediate impact. And so that means you know, the governments should help existing firms by trade credit, tech exemption, and debt restructuring to help them to survive. And so they can you know, provide jobs and they can be the foundation for the future growth. And also to use resources to reinvigorating re the existing industrial park and exploration zone. I know that in the Kaduna state and uh, Lagos and other states, there are already some industrial park and export processing zone. And it's very important to ensure those existing parks or zone will be functioning well under the current situation. And also to retaining the existing FDIs already have some foreign investment in the industrial park or other, you know, outside the parks. It's very important to retain them so they can continue to function, you know, by providing job and uh, export and generate the revenue for the government. And after the situation is returning to the normal, the government may use the industrial policy tool and especially the one I designed in the new structural economics, the growth identification and facilitation to identify the industry that the region uh, at the nation or some nation level that have the competitive advantages and they use the industrial policies to overcome the you know, coordination in the improvement of hard infrastructure and institution to reduce their transaction costs so they can quickly to become the you know, region's you know, export-oriented competitive industries. So that is my you know, main ideas and message I'd, like, message I'd like to mention to the panel for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Based, you mentioned something on growth identification and facilitation. So based on that, Your Excellency, let me come back to you. APC, your party, campaigned restructuring one on one of the points that they campaigned with in 2014, and they won power in 2015. Six years down the line, we are still talking about it. On top of it, you are regarded as one of the most influential governors in Nigeria. On top of it, please clap for him because he's one of the most influential. On top of it, you also chaired the APC restructuring agenda. Social media and the gossip circles, you are regarded as one of the closest to the president or member of what they call the cabal. <laughs> so the question is, what is really delaying this restructuring? And from, if you look at the exclusive list and the concurrent list, can you identify two, three, or four items you believe that when we move it from the exclusive list to the concurrent list, that it will really help in terms of growth identification and facilitation to really empower the states to create jobs, to reduce poverty, and to even reduce insecurity. And of course you know, Insecurity can be attributed to unemployment and poverty. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, let me first correct uh, one impression. I'm not, uh, I am very close to the president. I'm privileged to enjoy his affection and, 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 and confidence and uh, even though most people around the president don't like me, but he, he likes me, and I'm grateful to God for that. 
So I'm not a member of any cabal. Um, read the social media and whatever they write. When they mention the members of the cabal, I'm usually not uh, mentioned. Um, but yes, I enjoy uh, privileged access to the president and he's very fond of me and I am fond of him. And I, will, I, I, I stand by him all the time and, I, and he knows that. Um, yes, we campaigned uh, on the basis that would promote true federalism uh, in our manifesto. And this is part of the reason why our party uh, in 2017, midway into the first term, uh, appointed our committee to look into this and say, okay, this, this is a campaign promise, but how do we take that promise and convert it into policy, uh, program, and, and, and legislation? And I was privileged to chair that committee. There were nine governors in that committee ministers, senators, and so on. It was really broad uh, stakeholder group, and we worked and submitted a report, I think, uh, January 2018. Um, we made broad recommendations. Uh, I, I, you've asked me to pick three or four. I will, I, I will do that. But as I said, I recommend that uh, everyone interested in the future of this country should read our report. It's not in volumes, like, it's not big. You can sit in two, three hours, read the entire report, including the draft bills that we prepared, because every constitutional amendment we recommended, we also drafted the bill that can be presented to the National Assembly to effect the amendment. Any statutory amendment we proposed, we, we, we had the draft bills all done. So it's ready to go. Um, when we presented it to the party leadership, the feeling then was that if we tried to push it through the National Assembly a year to elections, it will, uh, it will be politicized. People will grandstand and oppose things just because of the next election. So the party leadership under uh, uh, former chairman, uh, Chief John Oyegun said, look, uh, let's step this down. We, the chairman and I actually went and briefed the president one evening, took him through the report, and he was excited and supported it fully. And said, this is the way to go. We, the military, took over power, and because of our training, we, we think in unitary terms, command and control. He said, but we need to do this. Uh, but the chairman said, but sir, you know, it will be politicized now, so let's wait until immediately after the election. Um, but of course, John Oyegun, could not continue as chairman. We had a new chairman and many things happened and we did not get round to present it as quickly as possible. So that's the delay. I want to assure Nigerians that the APC True Federalism Report is the position of the party. No one disagrees with it. The president fully supports it. The vice president, who is a lawyer, you know, endorsed everything there. And um, what we have said is, we don't need an executive bill from the president or from the Federal Executive Council to start action on these bills. Any member of the National Assembly can take any of the bill in our report and sponsor it as a private member bill. And I can assure you in the next uh, month or so, you will see some of that starting because some of them have come to me and said we are going to start working on some of this. What has delayed the National Assembly under the current leadership from acting on it is because the National Assembly has formed an ad hoc committee on constitutional review, co-chaired by the Deputy Senate President and the Deputy Speaker, and they want to do this the way it was attempted before. But I am of the view that we can do this piecemeal. We can take uh, the exclusive legislative list, look at it, we made certain recommendations of things that need to move to concurrent, do that, that's major, okay? You can take uh, the Petroleum uh, uh, Act and do the amendments, next. you can take the Mining and Minerals Act and do the amendments, you can do these things piecemeal. You don't have to do an omnibus constitutional amendment at one go. You can take the bits and pieces that are important. Now you've asked me, and, and as I said, some members of the National Assembly are already working on that. But in my honest opinion, 
one of the most important amendments that need to be made to the Constitution today is to create state police. The n plus problem has brought to the fore two things. First, state governors are not really in control of the police in their state. Some of us are more influential than others in getting the police to do what we ask them to do, depending on how you are perceived as being close to the president. You know, so I, I, you know, I, I, I must admit that you know, my police, the police in my state is fully cooperative. But that's because I'm seen to be close to, I can go into any office at the federal government and put my case and I will be supported. Not every governor has that. Secondly, it was clear from NSAS and other things that followed that the state has limited footprint all over Nigeria. There is a lot of ungoverned spaces from forests to urban areas in this country that we need more policemen. And we can only have more policemen if, as suggested by uh, the senior advocate, Dr. Azinge, we differentiate between federal police and state police, federal crimes and state crimes. And by the same logic, again supporting her, um, federal judiciary and state judiciary. We are the only federation that has one national judicial council that picks every high court judge. It's inefficient, it's ineffective, it's dysfunctional. Let every state has have its own judicial council, pick its judges, have its court of appeal, have its Supreme Court, because as Madame pointed out, issues like land tenure, chieftaincy matters are local to that state, and it is the Supreme Court of that state that will have people with the knowledge of customary law to be able to, uh, to, 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 to decide on it. It doesn't have to go to the federal Supreme Court. Now, if the federal judiciary wants to pick a very good judge from the state to federal high court or to court, federal court of appeal, they could do so. But let the state have some measure of control over the appointment of, of their judges up to a point. And we have recommended in the APC through federalism report to create state judicial council and limit the National Judicial Council to appellate uh, 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 federal High Court, Appellate and Supreme Court, and let every state, you know, I, I, I would like to have 40 High Court judges in Kaduna State. The average High Court judge in Kaduna State has 250 cases. No matter how much he tries, he cannot dispense justice in a timely manner. I want 40 judges. I have to go to NJC to approve, and they gave me three or four. I want 40 judges, we can pay for them, we can look after them, we can, the NJC can issue national guidelines on the selection of judges and have some oversight so that the states don't abuse this. But we need this. This is very, very important. State police, state judicial council, and then best the, the control of resources under the land with the state. That means minerals, should move from exclusive legislative leave to concurrent. Petroleum, oil, and gas should move from exclusive to concurrent because the states control the land. The oil and the minerals are in the land. When you collocate these two, you'll have, you'll have more efficient deployment of these resources. And the states can no longer complain that the federal government is an impediment. Because right now, many states hide behind one finger and say that the federal government is stopping us from doing this. If you do that, you know, you solve the problem. Of course, we have offshore oil, we have offshore minerals. Those ones should be vested in the Federation because they are protected by our Navy anyway. And no state can claim that the boundaries of their state include the extended economic zone under international law. So these are some of the recommendations that I think, and we have drafted the bill, that can easily pass through the National Assembly, come to the state, and I assure you 36 out of 36 state assemblies will support it so that we begin to reduce the depth and breadth of the federal government so that the federal government can shrink, focus on a few very important things like defense, national defense, national security, uh, monetary and fiscal policies, and do them very, very well. 
Right now, the federal government is doing a lot and not doing many of this lot very, very well. And it's affecting us as a country. It's also affecting the state's ability to also deliver on their mandate. It also gives the states, as I said, an, uh, an, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the excuse to hide behind one finger, as I said, and say, oh, the federal government is preventing us from doing this. Why not let them do it? You know? So this, 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 these are all in our true federalism uh, committee report, and as I said, my hope is that action will start on that, and many APC legislators have already indicated that they will start the process. They will not wait for the uh, joint committee, ad hoc committee, to, to do this. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Just a follow-up question. Yesterday we had a session on turning point. Yeah. And based on what you've explained, you said need for create state police, judicial reform, and Minera should move from the exclusive list to the concurrent list, so that at least the state can own what is yeah. land. Still going back to your influence, your reach, you said that most governors don't have the kind of influence and reach that you have. I didn't say influence. I, I, said, I, said, I said access. Okay, access. Yes, don't I, confuse the three. I, I think there are synonyms somehow. No, they are not. <laughs> okay. Um, they, they are not. No, 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 seriously. Uh, mm. and, and I want to use this opportunity. You know, um, the politics of power is that those that are around the president all the time are the ones with influence. Access is different. I see the president regularly. I see him and I speak frankly to him. I give advice and so on. But I'm not there I'm, yes. every day to make sure it is done. So I, I want you to differentiate between access and influence. Okay. I have access and many governors have access. To be fair, the president gives uh, all governors without regard to partisanship full access to him. Okay, of given, course, given your right, access. I have, I have access, yes. but I cannot say I have influence because I am not there to follow up every day and see that this is done. It okay. is though, you know, I have a state to run, a very difficult state, and I have major challenges that I have to face. So, you know, uh, 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 we, we, we do the best that we can, but there are officials, there are ministers, there are presidential aides whose job is to see that through. I am not one of them. Okay, let me uh, use the right word, access. Okay. Yes. So given your access, but you are still influential in APC. <laughs> not to the president now, this is to a APC now. And even Nigeria as well, as you've been around for. Are you giving Nigerians the assurance that before 2023, that actions with regards to this true federalism report will be taken? Before, at least so that we can be assured I, I, that I, at I, the end of the tenure of the, of, the, of the current administration, that there is a movement so that Nigeria can turn around. Prof, I, I cannot give assurance over something I have no full control over. Uh, all I know, all, the only assurance I can give Nigerians is that I, am, I know that the president fully supports this reform. I know that the current leadership of the National Assembly both the Speaker of the House as well as the Senate President are fully on board because we have briefed them, they are fully on board, so there is no, uh, it's not like the last time where we had a Senate President actively working against our party and the President. Today, there is alignment between the executive and the legislative branch and both leaders of the two houses are, you know, are, 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 are working on this. I also know that the Deputy Senate President and the Deputy Speaker are working around the clock to round up the work of their committees because most of the work has been done by uh, Dr. Azinge's uh, conference and, <laughs> and our report. So all yes. you need to do is to put the two, two together, together. And, uh, and deal with it. So we've been assured that they will do this. I, as I said, it is very, very clear that things have to change. We have to uh, redesign uh, the architecture of our politics, of our of governance, of the judiciary, of elections, everything that you know, various uh, conferences and committees have looked at and made very sound recommendations. They just need to be implemented. Uh, I believe that the current leadership of the National Assembly is committed to implementing that. I believe that the president is committed to assenting to any amendments that come before him because he has no disagreement 
whatsoever with anything in our report. It would not have been published, okay? We would have removed whatever he didn't want because of the great respect and reverence we have for him. So I, I, I don't see any problem. What I think uh, interest groups like NESG and civil society should do should, is to put pressure for action, for movement on this. But all the building blocks are there. We just need to cross the T's and dot the I's. And it, it can be done. I am confident it will happen. But you're asking me to give an assurance when I'm only, for the time being, the governor of Kaduna State. <laughs> if it is Kaduna State, I can give you some level of assurance after phoning my deputy to, to, to get her buy-in. But you're asking me to give assurance over something in Abuja. Uh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, in a position. We, we will appeal for your support. <laughs> um, my support can be taken for granted. I have, I have, I have advocated for this forever. I, I chaired the committee and all the, all, all, all the governors, some of them my seniors, you know, uh, signed that report and were very happy with it. And uh, we are committed to implementing it. I know that for sure. Okay, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me thank come you. to you, Dr. Azinger. Your Excellency has mentioned police, judiciary, mineral, removing mineral from specifically to the concurrent lease. But looking at our states, even the ones that they have, the powers they have in the concurrent list, some people argue that even within the regional level, like for example, Northwest, Southwest, Southeast, South South, and the other regions, that the states can actually collaborate better to achieve more impact in their different regions. Can you identify? three items that they can focus on that will more or less create more work, what we can call economies of scale or economies of scope to more or less help their different regions and, and also their states to move forward as we say about turning, turning point conservation. Um, that's a very good question. And um, uh, before I get into that question, I wish to say that the being of a problem is political will. The, His Excellency's committee have come up with lofty ideas on restructuring, decentralization, devolution of powers. They've drafted statutes, they've drafted bills. The National Conference has also articulated a bill for the for alteration of our constitution with all the relevant portions clearly out outlined, documented in one book. At the same time, they have also drafted some statutes and said, okay, here it is, handed over to government. Government, you can sponsor it as a bill. Any of your members can sponsor it. These are the ones that are ready. The ones that were not ready was due to time constraint of the conference. Now, if all this has been ready for some years, for some time now. We have been suffering from bottlenecks, bureaucratic bottlenecks that pervades a public system, a private system, and everything that we do. So unless we unclog that well, nobody can be here and tell you that tomorrow this problem is solved is not possible. He has gone to the president, the president agreed with him, and the president said, oh, that was the mindset of the military. Now I agree, this is the mindset of democracy. We shall hit the round, ground running. What has happened? Bureaucratic bottlenecks. So unless we unclog this, it will continue to happen. It's just like a typical example. You go to the ministry, you want to push the file. The file is missing, and it's been there. But when you perform the Nigerian way, the file surfaces. So we've got to unclog this. Be that as it may, you uh, highlighted what are those things. For instance, from the NSAS, we have to learn a lot of lessons. Because if we don't implement what the APC has articulated or the national conference with the greatest respect in this country is one step forward and 10 steps backwards. We remain in perpetual darkness without knowing where to go from there. And it will eclipse all of us 
at a particular stage in our lives. So therefore, let us take the constitutional suggestion for a review of our national security. Advocating for state police and community policing. We recommended at the conference the entrenchment of the geopolitical zones in our constitution. But not to take the place of the states as the federating units. The geopolitical zones can decide to merge themselves together to fight a common economic problem that pervades to them. They can also decide to demerge. For instance, the Southwest has practiced it in the Motokun issue. They've come together. Their various houses of assembly has put up laws. And they now have community policing entrenched in the Southwest. It's doable in other states. That is the competitiveness we're talking about states. So if it is doable in other states, take Delaware in America. Look at how they've made themselves known for incorporation issues. In the same way, other states can decide to follow. They may decide, oh, we improve on it, or we don't improve on it. We have also seen the incapacitated powers of our executive governors. Incredible to say the least. Government, governor without powers. Yet you are the governor of a state. You're the chief security officer. So state police is imperative. I think that we have overcome the idea that governors will use it against their political opponents. That argument is hollow. Ah, yes, the governor can say it's eight years. After that, what next? It is for the individuals there. So I think it is right time we have a state police. And let's see where we go from there. If it could be hijacked by governors, then let the, fe the federal, the hijacking, uh, hijacking the federal. And what has come out of it? Look at the documented scenarios of the NSAS uh, um, uh, issues on the police brutality to our citizens. We have recommended about the empowerment of these youths in different aspects of life. Even made laws on social security. The political will again comes back. How do we achieve it? The cost of governance in this country is too high. We recommended that the constitution as it is right now says that each state should produce a minister. That gives you automatically 36 ministers. What do we need it for? We have recommended that each of political zone should produce two ministers. You can run with 18 ministers. If you have a focus on the bearing and what you want to achieve, you go ahead and run with it. We have also recommended on the issue of revenue sharing, it is not enough to go for both the state and the national. You go to the National Assembly and you present your estimates. That's not enough. If you present your estimate, you must back it up with a timetable of how you're going to execute it and what it costs. And whatever is the remnant that is left must go to development of capital projects. And even at that, where you see that there is a deficit, you can now ask for a supplementary, properly guided by a time frame structure of how you are going to achieve it. When we have discipline in governance and transparency, then we can achieve a lot. These are also part of the constitutional amendment. I must also dare say, that the issue of Zamfara and mineral oil in the region in the country. Again, we go back to devolution of powers. His Excellency has sealed it all about moving mineral and oil from the exclusive legislative list. If you would do it, Zamfara is right in what they are doing. And you give the Niger Delta a bite to do what they want to do. 
the modular refineries they want to, they can go ahead and do it for the betterment of the... I mean, America has developed even to the extent that somebody owns what is on top of the land, another one owns what is under. The Bush family may own the oil under, but somebody has what is on top of the land. The problem with us is ethnic reasoning cl be clouding our, uh, our uh, uh, ability to decide that this is what is good for us. The earlier we rise above that and then place excellence and transparency above board, what is it that you're going to offer? I mean, government, what I want is to deliver and have my name in gold. In other words, our cultural differences on how we eulogize people who have gone into crime, 419 and the rest, should take the back seats. And all this issue is raging with zoning. We also say, okay, if we recognize the geopolitical group, then not it is your turn is entrenched in the constitution and entrenched in our political parties. If it is your turn, fine, go for it. South, if it's your turn, go for it. And within the geopolitical uh, zones, again, if you, it is your turn to produce precedent and you produce it, when it is your turn again to produce vice, then it goes to the state that never ever produced before. And the same vein, the governors, they, they rotate it amongst their three um, uh, senatorial zone. But we have, having said that, I must also say that there should be some form of justice and fairness in all that we do. We, it is high time that chapter two of the constitution is made justiciable. And in making that chapter two justiciable, wherein lies the fairness? Whereby one geopolitical zone has five states, another six, another seven. It's either we make them equal and then we have equal distribution of resources. And if we are going to practice true federalism, we will get to the states where the center no longer becomes attractive. Where the center is tax driven, the contributions from the states will run the center. There is no state in this country that is not naturally endowed. What with human and material resources, I dare say, there is none. This issue of federal character sometimes enthrones mediocrity. You want somebody, I must say somebody from Enugu State, and then I take somebody who is not the best and the brightest. It hits us badly, and then we are complaining. So there's so much to restructure, just so much. And then the local governments. Let's come to the issue of local government. The states are foisted by the constitution to operate the local governments that they have today. Some of the states may not want that number of local governments. When we devolve power, the states will determine the number of local governments that they want, that they can effectively govern with to reach and permeate the grassroots to have the dividend of democracy. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. From my on everything or no on two things. On just because two things. Uh, yeah because uh, because I think uh, Dr. Alzinga has contradicted herself um, in one way. Um, I I do not believe that um, we should. Be, we, we should be driven in our politics and our economics by distribution, whether or not there is logic behind it. I do not think we have practiced that. Federal character is part of it. Each state must have a minister, this and that and this, and this is where we are. By entrenching in the constitution uh, rotation of power, 
entrenching geopolitical view, you are further entrenching that culture of distribution. In my honest view, Nigeria went wrong when we focused on distribution rather than production. We like to distribute, like to share everything. You've gone as far as say that in a state, the governorship should rotate around senatorial district. That is, that, that, that is absurd. Nobody does that. There is no country in the world that has made progress in the last 50 years that picks its leaders based on where they come from. None. I don't know one. Till today, I am yet to find a country that says, this is how you select leaders based on where they come from. And if you're from this part of the country, you've done uh, four years as governor, part of the state, you've done eight years as governor, it must go to another part, even if that part has a lesser competent person than another part of the state. I think if we move away from this fixation about distribution, hiding behind one finger of fairness to selecting or picking the best person to get the job done. When the job is done, even if the man or woman that does it is blue or black, everybody benefits. Right now we are distributing this and it is not be, we, are, we are not making any progress because the focus is the distribution. The focus is to look and say, eh, someone from my village is a governor. But having a governor from a village doesn't give you anything. It is grossly incompetent. In fact, it brings the system down. Today, we live in a country in which for federal government colleges, entrance exam, or jump, one state has a cutoff of X, and another state has a cutoff of 10 times X. And you say you are building a nation. You are not. You are creating bitterness from the grassroots. And it is all, madam, it is all because we are focused on distribution. Today in this country, apart from the constitution saying we must have a minister from each state, and that provision was in the 1979 constitution because at that time we had 19 states. So it made sense. 19 states, 19 ministries, 19 ministers. Now we have 36 states. Whether a president likes it or not, he must have 36 ministers. Absurd. But it is still the same logic of distribution that created federal character, created the cut-off scores for jump and so on. I am from the northern states. For the past 30 years, we've been called educationally disadvantaged. Okay? We are giving lower cut-off scores to catch up. Are we cut off? <laughs> it has only made people lazy. So. I'm sorry, madam. You know, I'm sorry. I don't think we should hide. We should hide behind fairness and say that we everyone must be equal. The best we can do is to give people equal opportunity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You cannot say. I will take. I will take the question of zones. You cannot say that zones must have the same seats when their land mass and population are not the same. Their viability as federating units are not equal. Is a sure path to perdition. The earlier Nigeria retraces its steps and puts merit, competence, capability, and capacity ahead of everything else while still observing diversity. And here, when I talk about diversity, I'm not talking about ethnic and religious diversity alone. I'm talking about gender diversity. I'm talking about demographic diversity. We can't have a country with 90% of our population below the age of 40 all ruled by all people like me. We can't. We must, have, we, we must have young people in government being trained to take over from us. I'm trying to do that in Kaduna. I don't know whether this is being done, but we can, you can never decree equality, madam. Not by law, not by practice. You lead to inefficiency. What you can do is to give every society a framework of equal opportunity. Those that take advantage of the opportunity will prosper. Those that don't, pay for it. That's what we should be guided by. Thank, Thank you. you very much, <laughs> your, your Excellency. I've been told.
I'm, I'm sure you want to respond, senior advocate. But I've been told that we can continue the debate. We, we have uh, okay. time because <laughs> we have um, we have so many questions. Yeah. I mean, while on both sides there are merits on what senior advocate has said and what your senator has said, but what is more fundamental <coughs> is that the environment for that opportunities are created, so that the environment is created to enable people to have good opportunities. Because there's a book written by Amitya Sen that he says development as freedom. freedom. So when you create the opportunities for people to thrive, you find out that the issues of where you're from or where you're not from will Doesn't not matter, matter anymore. What yeah. the challenge is when you don't have that environment. Then you now have to rethink on how to create that environment that will create that opportunity. But based, we have so many questions. Well, let me ask you these questions, Your Excellency. So yesterday we talked about as I said, turning point. And one of the issues that came up was how some states are actually trying to do a lot better than other states. I read uh, that you are trying to plant 5,000 economic trees in Kaduna State from now, five, five million. million, sorry, five million economic trees from now to 2023. Very commendable. The question then is, what are the governors doing through the NGF to collaborate across states? You said there is too much focus on collaboration with the federal government. But latent opportunities exist across states. We have seen examples like the KB Lagos, right? What are the governors doing to codify these collaborations? So in Northwest, for example, Kaduna State seems to be an outlier as compared to other states in certain variables. So the question is, what are you doing as the governor of Kaduna State, the light in the Northwest, to see how you can actually ensure collaboration and partnership with other states in the Northwest? Well, I, you know, actually a lot of that is going on. Okay, at the level of the Nigerian Governors Forum, we have a peer review mechanism where we try to get best practices of a certain state and see how we can share and copy. And uh, I, I must say that, you know, we, we did a lot of tax reforms in Kaduna, but we, before we started, we sent a delegation to Lagos Edo and River states to see why they are collecting revenues better than us. Rivers, we found that they are just lucky they have oil companies. Okay? But Edo and Lagos, we learned important lessons which we used in revamping our tax code and tax laws. And that has been very helpful. So there is that framework. Now, I know that it's not being publicized, uh, but there is a lot of it. There is a lot of learning between governors. Secondly, um, at the level of the Northern State Governors Forum and uh, Northwest Governors Forum, because we have all these groupings, there is a lot of learning. And there are some states, you know, you mentioned Kaduna uh, as a uh, light and so on. I think Kaduna gets a lot of publicity because of our history. We are capital of northern region. We are the political capital of, of, uh, of the north, if not Nigeria. So we get a lot of attention, good and, be and, and bad. And because of the governor as yeah. well. I, I, I don't know whether it's because of the governor. <laughs> I think... In, you know, I think uh, good and bad we get over publicized. But I want to tell you, there are some states in the Northwest. You know, I, I, I will mention Jigawa State. Jigawa State is doing incredible reforms. They are doing very, very well. Their governor is focused. He's doing a lot of things. And Jigawa has sent delegations to Kaduna several times to study our land registration system, ease of doing business, tax system, and so on and so forth. But it's all done very quietly. We have the Northwest Governors Forum where we co collaborated first uh, in 2015, for instance, to address cattle rustling, security arrangements and so on. So we have that. It is unfortunate that it's not well publicized. Uh, it is also uh, maybe because some governors are too proud to say I'm copying from this governor. I don't, I have no problem uh, admitting that, uh, you know, someone has done something well, I will go and copy it. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I have enough self-confidence to admit that we copied some from Edo and our land use, uh, sorry, our property tax law was lifted from Lagos state law. I, ha I have no shame. If someone has got something right, why not copy it? Why try to reinvent the wheel? But some governors don't want to admit that we are sharing experiences and we are learning from each other and I have copied from X or Y. But I want to assure you without revealing that's I have that's mentioned that's Jigawa because he doesn't mind. He boasts about it, that he shamelessly copies Kaduna. That's why I mentioned. But there yeah. are many governors 
um, that have sent delegations to Kaduna to study one aspect of what we have done by another, and we've also gone to other states. So there is that line. There's a lot of collaboration between the states, but unfortunately, it's below the radar because some are too proud to admit. Um, uh, we, I believe that uh, this, particularly under the leadership of Governor Fayemi now, this peer review mechanism is being intensified. Uh, what maybe needs to be done is to publicize it a bit more. But it's being done. We are learning from each other. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I have, we are monitoring the time, but let me just ask if we have one or two questions from the public or participants. Okay, let me, to be gender sensitive, <laughs> let me start with her, huh? then you. If we can take, oh, three. Three questions and... There, there is oh. another woman behind, I think. I always fight for the women. Oh, there is even... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, please. Can you take the microphone to, to her, please? Thank you very much for you know, what has been a very, very practical and enlightening session, because I believe very, very strongly that our hope of a brighter future lies very seriously in subnationals and as we devolve powers. So this is crucial. I observe that uh, for some reason, um, issues around population growth somehow slips away from the conversation. And it's absolutely crucial. Um, I recall yesterday when uh, Dr. Salami was here, he did mention the fact that if we're talking about macroeconomic stability, which is particularly crucial, uh, for it to be meaningful down to grassroots level, our economic growth has to exceed population. the population growth. And unfortunately, for many years, the population growth has been at an alarming rate, and it has been accelerating faster than mm. economic growth. So when we begin to talk about the role of subnationals, we also know that poverty levels vary exceedingly. Yesterday, we were talking about one of the states having 87% poverty levels. Mm -hmm. And you find all these children all over the streets based on rural migration. So I want to know what is the role of the state? Because if we start talking about IGR and so on and so forth and size of government, ignoring how much we're also contributing at subnational level to the burgeoning population that we can least afford to put in the right perspective if we want to be where we want to be in the Committee of Nations. So what is the role of subnational government and what might be the plans? And also to you, ma'am, what might be the legal framework that we need to embark upon because we're already a decade late? Thank you very much. Th thank you very much. I think it might be better to take the take four the questions, questions yeah. Yeah. and we now uh, continue. But before we take another question, let me recognize the presence of the Honorable Minister of Finance in our midst. Uh, Madam Minister, you're welcome. Th thank you. So the next question will be from uh, uh, Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. Then you, then I'll... Well, thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Um, good to see you and good to hear you. Of course, uh, Gov. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've read, I've followed you. I had the privilege of serving with you in the cabinet and your intellect has never been in contention. And so when you were appointed to head the restructuring agenda committee for the APC, I did not expect anything less than the quality of the report that came out. I also had the privilege of being at the 2014 National Conference and listening to Ms. Azinge, delightful to listen to her and hear how she's restated 
the very key aspects of our deliberations over several months. Now, Governor, the first question is this. Is it safe to assume that the inertia in embracing these far-reaching reforms that are, were, were proposed in the 2014 National Conference, and even by your committee, Mr., uh, you know, your APC committee, is it safe to assume it is because there are people or sections of the country that believe it is in their interest to continue to retain the advantage which other parts of the country are crying daily about? Is that possibly the case? And if that is the case, people like you have the intellect and the exposure and the education. What are you doing to try to explain to the sections of the country concerned that the entire situation is unsustainable and that really all of these things are serving to push Nigeria to the brink and it is imperative that we pull back. That is my first question. The second question is, you know, your policy initiatives, commendable in several respects in the education sector, in urban planning, in urban renewal, in the healthcare, even the investments in the youth, the fellowship, the Sarkashim Ibrahim fellowships, highly commendable. But there's a sticky point in Kaduna, the Southern Kaduna situation. I think that it is a blight. It's a blight on everything that you've tried to do. Maybe we don't know what is really happening. Maybe there are things you'd like to tell us. But if this meeting is about competitiveness of the national, of subnationals, the kind, level of insecurity that is being reported from that part of your state can only serve to undermine your competitiveness. So perhaps you're going to really educate us and help us to better understand what is happening there so that we can at least give you our 100% you know, support for what I think is mostly an excellent job in terms of development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for your contributions. My name is Yomi Badejoksna. I'm a public relations consultant. Thank you, madam. Uh, Madam, I have access. I hope I'll have influence today. <laughs> Just an intervention, please. If we can, please be very brief that's and right. direct to the question right. because of I, time, please. Okay. Um, my, first of all, Madam, the passion you show for constitutional reforms is not the body language of your party. There's a variance. You think or you feel that your, your party, in the utterances that your party makes, they are not supporting it. My view, so what's the solution? I have a very radical proposition that we suspend the 2023 elections until we get this constitutional reform right. Now, it doesn't mean that the same government should be in power. Perhaps we have to look for something because if we, we cannot run another election under this constitution, it will mark the end of Nigeria. We should consider it perhaps six months, one year. Already the plans are on for 2023, and people are already jostling. That's my proposal. I think it's something the government should look at. Thank you. And the last question, please, because of time. It's, 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 the, lady. it's the lady there. Okay. The lady. The lady. Aladi, I've been overruled okay. by Your Excellency. No, 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 no. You, you can have it, but I just want to ensure that the lady yeah. gets a chance. <laughs> right, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> sir, permit me to stand on existing protocols. Sir, in your opinion, you stated that most of the problems of Nigeria should be resolved by the governors. In a way, you made me to understand that if local regions are developed, our country in Nigeria will be developed. And um, Professor Lee also said so, that same, that... In his assertion, he noted that national and local regions should work on their, to develop their industries. So, sir, the question is, how do we get the state and local region working before the report, your, the report of the constitutional review turns out? How do we get the state working? Because I want 
my children to come to benefit from local region. I'm a village girl. I love my village. I love my state. How do we get the state working? How do we make the environment secure for everybody? How do we bring investors to invest in our local region? I see resources in my state wasting. I see la horrible lands wasting. How do we get this thing working? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Th thank you very much. You, and you can take him. OK. Uh, Elijah, just very brief, please, because of time. Quickly, direct to the question, please. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the opportunity. When I, any time I look at the moderator, he resembles governor of Delta State, I think. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> so, Your Excellency, my name is Bala Abdullahi Kwatu. I'm from Urban Shelter. Um, you know, these days we have news from social media. I read one which says every adult child, 18 years and above from um, Kaduna State, to pay tax of 1,000. If that information is correct, then it's a commendable one because it's a sit up for the youth, no lazy youth, I mean. Um, how do you intend to carry out this? And um, secondly, will there also come with social intervention by from particularly uh, the graduate, somebody just leaving school, maybe three months stipends, something like that to prepare him? And I'm also worried, I'm a farmer anyway, with the five million trees campaign. Campaign means more trees. Uh, kidnappers then, or how do we tackle this? And madam, uh, my question is, true federalism, according to you, begot, uh, makes it more, less attractive. Is that the case with the uh, US? taken region from the recent election. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Because of time, let me suggest maybe the best way to answer this question. I will suggest that Your Excellency, you uh, address the questions raised by Mr. Frank Mugge with regards to Kaduna and other questions. And Dr. Zinge, if you can address the question with regards to the possibility of doing this constitutional reform before 2023 election. What are the legal issues and constitutional issues? But if we can be Brief, please, because of time. We've been told that the next panel session is already, they're already waiting and they're not in Nigeria and we need to make sure that we manage their time. Your Excellency, please. Okay, um, thank you very much. I will be as quick, as fast as possible and I hope the conversation will continue. Um, you talk about demographics, you know, our population growth versus economic growth rate and so on. There are, there is a lot of debate on that. Because countries that have tried to curtail demographic growth, like China, have now reversed themselves. Singapore even pays you to have children. The current thinking in development economics is that population growth is not bad if you can ensure your growth rate is faster and the population is educated and healthy. Okay? So that's my answer to you. Uh, but at the state level, we are all trying our best to reduce the fertility levels. And what is the best way? The best way is to educate girls. If you make sure that your girls are educated, you immediately reduce fertility levels without imposing any uh, cap on children and all that. All those caps, the maximum for the, no, that's not the way. The way is to ensure that the girls get at least senior secondary school education because then they take their fate into their own hands and not just be region. First, they start late. They start at least from the age of 18. And because they now know contraceptives and so on and so forth, you know, uh, yeah, that can be done. Of course, how to do that is a whole subject that we can have a conversation on. We are, we are doing it in Kaduna, uh, but this is my response. Now, Frank uh, asked a question about uh, restructuring and is it that some parts of the country want to preserve any advantages? With the greatest respect, these advantages are just perceived. They are just perceived advantages. Maybe they favor a few, but if, if many people think that northerners are against restructuring, there is a difference between someone of Northern Elders Forum shouting against restructuring and northerners. There are a hundred million of us. 
there are over 100 million of us. And whatever advantages that person is getting for himself does not accrue to the rest of the region. We have the highest number of out-of-school children. We have the highest po poverty rate. We have the lowest uh, jump cut-off rate, this and that. So what are the advantages to the north of the current situation? None. As the governor of Kaduna State, I have had to deal with these issues and try to see how I can get my state and my, the, the people of my state up on the ladder. And restructuring, the current situation doesn't help me. In fact, it constrains me. Okay? So I think you need to differentiate between the noise of a few and the voice of the silent majority. That is one. Secondly, you have to understand that the way some people present restructuring in an insultive and derogatory manner doesn't help the case. It's something that is not to be emotional. We should have an honest conversation about what is working and what is not. And not call names or think that, oh, these people are too backwards to understand, or these people are against you because they have advantage. We don't have any advantage here. If there are northern leaders today, if you're going to say you want to pick 100 northern leaders, I think by virtue of the fact that I'm a governor, I'm one of them. And this is what I'm saying. And none of my colleagues, governors in the north, disagree with what I'm saying. So who are these northerners against restructuring? Who are they? Who, who are, what is their bona fide? Who are they speaking for? No one. They are speaking for themselves. So let us have a very honest, unemotional conversation without looking down on people or insulting them or framing them. Then we'll make progress. This is a major, major problem, frankly. Okay. Um, on Southern Kaduna, this, this requires another session, all right? I can't answer that question. What I would like to appeal to the Nigerian Economic Summit Group is to invite me for a three to four hour session, uh, virtual and physical. And I will explain everything because the Southern Kaduna problem is a 200 year problem has history going, dating back to 200 years, and it has more recent history dating back 40 years. And most of the people that comment on it or write on it don't even understand anything about it. I'm from Kaduna State. I've spent most of my life there. I understand the problem. I, and I'm trying to solve it. But it requires us to sit down. I will present you facts and figures and history that you don't know. And I will encourage, after, I, after we have that session, that you constitute a delegation to go to Southern Kaduna and speak to people there, not what you are hearing or what people are writing or reporting. I will not take a lot of the uh, time to, as I said, you cannot summarize a 200-year problem in two minutes. So I have offered myself, I'm available for us to have a session on that. And let me, let, let me say this, though the violence in Southern Kaduna is over-reported. Okay. The insecurity in northern Kaduna, the insecurity in, in, in Igabi, Birnungwari, uh, uh, Giwa, is more than in southern Kaduna. But the newspapers based in Lagos and Abuja choose to focus on that rather than what is really happening. We have the tally of the numbers of people killed, you know, and so on. And I can prove to you empirically with numbers that more people have been killed, kidnapped, you know, than in, South, in one year than in Southern Kaduna in the last five years. But the headlines are always about Southern Kaduna. It amuses some of us. Sometimes it upsets us. But, you know, we have a problem and we are solving it. Thank you very much. Right? Finally, no, there, uh, um, uh, um, there are two that I want to comment on very quickly. Um, there are, there are times when people make recommendations that are impossible to implement. I will give one common example. In your conference, madam, you recommended the creation of states, as many as 58. I want to assure you that short of a breakdown of constitutional order and, and another a military government coming in, no state in Nigeria will ever be created. The Constitution has provision to create states. It will never be. You know why? 
creating any state is a zero sum game. Everyone loses. I get less federation account allocation. My state assembly will not vote for another state to be created. Why? There are people that make recommendations. Let's have one legislature, uh, you know, abolish the Senate. It is the senators that will vote to abolish themselves. Do you think it will happen? <laughs> Please. So look, Nigeria's constitution is not perfect. There are areas we can improve, but please, let us cease and desist from making impossible recommendations that will not go anywhere. Let us focus on what is possible. And I've mentioned a few that are possible. I think we can do state policy. It's possible. We can invest minerals and oil in states. It's possible. But the moment you start saying create more states, it means what is coming from FARC, I will have to give up to, for a new state. I will vote against it. The 36 states, many of them are not viable fiscally. Why do you want to create more? Do you want to create a state for every ethnic group? You need to create 550. So let's move away from that and look at what we have and try to make it work to the best of our ability. I think I wanted to make this point very, very clear. And the, my, the, my colleague here that is saying, let's suspend. Who, who will, under what constitutional or legal order can we defy elections? And who will be in charge? Who, you, you, you said, the government of the day, you want an interim government, how? It's not going to happen. And you know what? Whether there is restructuring or not, there will be elections in 2024. You and I, if God spares our lives, let's talk then. Nothing will happen. Nigerian elites have the capacity to threaten and shout and push the country to the brink. But at the end of the day, where it is near the brink, they remember their nice houses in Ikoi and London, and they push back. <laughs> Some of us that have little or nothing, we're not afraid, we're suicide bombers, let it happen. <laughs> but we know, we know many of these people that are pushing these agendas. At the last minute, crunch time, they'll step back. They'll do nothing, it will happen. But let's do the right thing. But don't make impossible recommendations, that's what I'm saying. And what you are recommending, it's impossible. Okay. Finally. Thank you, Your Excellency. Finally, no, 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 finally. <laughs> The lady, as I, you know, I, I always fight for the woman. She asked, how do we start now with, before the constitutional reform? I think, as I said, I think that our constitution is not perfect, but there are many state governments and state governors that are working within those constraints and making progress in their states. So the key, madam, is quality of governance, quality of people in government. And this is why I always make the point that it is not good enough to sit on the sidelines and abuse and criticize, get involved. Because if the smartest people in the country are not involved in politics and governance, if young people only tweet, they don't want to join political parties and influence change, this country will never, never change. We'll have a talk on development levy. Uh, I'll explain to you why. But we also have a social safety net below it. And, um, we can have that discussion offline. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I, I've been, um, it's the only thing remaining is for me to be arrested because of, of <laughs> keeping this session going. They said time, is, we've actually run out of time. And please and please, Dr. Azinge, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to say in one minute okay. so that we can conclude. Uh, I will also invite uh, Professor Lee to say just something at concluding, just one minute. And well, there are so many questions coming from online, online session, which we will not be able to, to take at all. Just one minute, Dr. Azinge and Justin Lee, one minute. Thank okay, you. in one minute. Yes, just all, a passing word yes, or something like that. All I advocate for at this point in time is the political will. The political will to implement the APC report as well as that of the national conference. The job has been done. It's just the political will. That's Excellent. Thank you very much. I really apologize because of the time. And Professor Lee, please and please, this is one minute is one minute. World Bank time, one minute, or Chinese time, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, very good. I have been sitting quietly to listen to this very important conversation. And that means, at the end, to echo governors, their rule phase, position on the distribution and production, and highlight 
the importance of production. I fully concord with him. Because only with production, you can generate job and also create wealth for distribution. But according to my new structural economics, there's one way to achieve competitiveness in production and uh, to achieve equity, that is distribution simultaneously. That is to follow the competitive advantages of the nation and subnation to develop your industrialization. Currently, Nigeria is richly endowed with labor force, especially young labor. And so Nigeria should have competitive advantages in labor intensive technology and industries. And if you have a facilitation state to support the development of labor intensive industrialization, you can generate the most job for the young people. At the same time, you can be competitiveness, generate more wealth, accumulate the capitals. Gradually, the factory endowments will change from relatively abundant in labor force to relative abundant in capitals. By this way, wage will increase rapidly. And so the poor people who only have their labor force to generate income can benefit the most by quick rising wages. At the same time, the return to capital will gradually decline. And by this way, you can reduce the income disparity. So that's one way to achieve competitiveness and uh, distribution equity simultaneously. By that, you need to have a vision and certainly you also need to have the leadership in the implementation. And I hope Katuna State will be a state to follow this approach and to demonstrate that in Nigeria, you can achieve competitiveness and uh, equity simultaneously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the Institute of uh, Structural Economics is consultant to Kaduna State, so that he's advising us on how to do this. So we are doing it as we speak right now. Interesting. Thank you very, thank you very, very much, mm -hmm. Professor Lee. Let me also say that there are so many questions coming online, but we cannot take all of them together. There is a question from Razak Oloyeru. There is also Olu Ogunfora and many, many others. Of course, we know there is this old Honda car that is called Discussion Continues. So the discussion will definitely continue. But on this note, let me say a very, very big thank you to Your Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Nasia Rufai, Dr. Epif um, Valeria Zinge, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and also Professor Lee in China, and all the participants for a very interesting uh, discussion. What I gathered from this discussion is that Nigeria needs to be restructured. We need to really review our constitution. We need to also review other factors that are constraining the real empowerment of subnationals so that our youth can be empowered, so that our youth can be employed, so insecurity can reduce, and that Nigeria can really be a truly sustainably developing society. So on this note, I say thank you very much for listening, and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you. Thank you.